and if I'm not done by 11.45, stop me. <laughs> Five minute warning. Probably. Five minute warning. All right. Um, normally, for our visitors today, uh, normally I, I do an overhead presentation that we follow along with together, and we read lots of scripture and things. Um, I I, I kind of worked on that this week, but for this, I, I just had a tornado of thoughts and things to talk about, and then for the sake of uh, hopefully being a little briefer today than normal, I'm going to just, I'm going to just talk if that's okay. Um, we're going to, we're going to talk about subjects that most of you should be familiar with and just kind of some general ideas I think I want you to keep in your heart as we're coming into this Christmas season of um, just things about the magnificence of God. Amen? Yeah. Cool. All right. So don't, don't, if you're visiting today, don't go home and say, that God didn't even open the Bible. Normally I do. All right. <laughs> Normally, I do. Um, in the in the Word of God, there's so many. It's just full of these nuggets, these ideas, these principles, these concepts, and 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 so many of them. When we get into the New Testament, the New Covenant stuff, it's just a one right after another. There's there's a lot of really glaringly obvious ones, and then there's some um, what you would think of. You know, you go you read those enough, and then you start to notice there's some other really really cool things in there. And, 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 and those little things that seem a little less obvious kind of become rabbit holes that burrow into your heart and get you to dream and imagine and walk with God. Yeah. And when I um, think about Christmas, and it's easy that Christmas time you start thinking about the, the inception of Jesus, the birth of Jesus, and we'll, we'll discuss that some today. But you know what the, the thing that we, we all know if you've been in church any amount of time, you all know that Jesus had brothers. But have you ever thought about the fact that Jesus had brothers? Like he had siblings. And and like that, is, you know, it's a fact that most of us know, if you've read your Bible at all, you, you've somewhere in the journey, you heard that he had brothers and sisters and siblings. But, but it, it also, you can't lose sight of some of these more obscure details because I think it's really easy for us to hear about the miraculous inception of Jesus and the Virgin Mary and, and, and to go back and today hopefully we'll discuss um, how much God orchestrated to get that in place and to get that in motion and what he was accomplishing through all that. But it's really easy for us to mistakenly create a category in our mind that says he was this miraculous anomaly of a moment in time where God produced himself on the earth to fix our problem, our connection with him. Um, as we discussed in the past, it's really easy to put him in this supernatural, miraculous category and then flash forward to him being an adult where he's manifested as this, as this miraculous rabbi, this man of God, this son of God, this, this healer, this prophet. This, he's all these things. And it's really easy to forget that God put him in a normal family. He, or he had brothers and sisters and they had, um, you know, they had jobs. They were carpenters and they, they, they just they lived life. And, and, and the Word of God, when I say the Word of God, the Word of God is, is, is many things. When we talk about the Word of God, we're often talking about the written Word of God, the Bibles that you have with you at home, and, and that's the written Word of God. But we also call Jesus, uh, the, the man Jesus who lived 2,000 years ago, we call him the Word of God in bodily. Um, the bodily word of God, as he's referred to as that. And then there's the, um, the, the the word of God that John says was also at the beginning of time who was creating all things. So there's this there's this predating the new covenant word of God, this essence of the Jesus is, is in a sense this 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 all powerful word of God that created all things and through him all things were made and without him nothing was made. And then there's this bodily form. Of, of, of the word of God that we call Jesus of Nazareth and then that evolves into not equal to but it did evolve into a version of that is the written word of God and we call it the written word of God and we believe it as as you know Christians we believe this to be a a living word of God um, meaning we don't believe this to be a history book we believe it to be a living oracle of God yeah. that he, uh, you know, on the lowest level of understanding of that, you may believe that that means that his he through the Holy Spirit um, ordained what would be in it and what and all this and that, and that's that's great, that's true. 
but he's more than that. He's he's in these words. Yeah. And he's in these words, and there's a thing, this notion of grace, this idea that grace came through Jesus into this new covenant. And grace is like this supernatural empowerment to be what God says you are to be, that he made you to be. Like it's this. He helps you be the thing that you couldn't otherwise be. And we can find that in this word of God. We can find that grace in reading himself in these pages. Now, he's also, remember, he was, he was creating things in Genesis. So he's kind of in the whole storyline. He's in the, the, the successes and failures of the Israelite people for 4,000 years preceding the new covenant. He's... He's, uh, he's in the prophets, he's in the poems, he's in the bodily form, he's in, he's in all of it, right? He's, Jesus is, we talked earlier about um, Luke, the gospel of Luke is written to a guy named Theophilus. It's this letter of an account of the gospel of Jesus, right? And then we get to the book of Acts, which you all know that we have the four gospels that talk about Jesus on earth, and then we get to the Acts. And we, many of us mistakenly believe that that was a story about the actions of the apostles, but that's not actually true. It opens up with, O oh, Theopolis, I write to you again to finish the story of Jesus. It, it, it's, 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 the, it's the continued story of the post-resurrection Jesus yeah. manifesting in the people's yeah. hearts. Yeah. It's this living word of God, and... and I keep saying that because as we go through some of these ideas and things today to think about as we're coming into this season, think about this. While our Bible is one of our greatest um, treasures of history, of our history as, a, as God's people, going all the way back 6,000 years, it is our greatest history treasure. It is not a history book. It is meant to be read and believed to be factual history, but understood to be a living word of God that yeah. somehow fits into your yeah. life today. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so while we need to teach our children the story of how Jesus came to earth miraculously, the, mar the miraculous inception of Mary, we need to teach all these things. And we'll talk about that next week with the kids. But, but just know that for some reason, we were meant to never forget these things. And that reason is God never gives up on any of us. Yeah. And our situations are a little more applicable to all of these ideas than we sometimes realize. Yes? Yeah. And, and we, a lot of times in here we, we, show, uh, we show New Testament ideas and concepts and we show how they, even the New Testament writers, authors, they, they reference Old Testament stories. It's, it's these stories that had taken place and had their own context, um, but somehow they flash forward in that case a thousand or two thousand years later. And it's this idea that's always going to be true. And this, this word of God, we consider it to be immutable. We consider it to be eternal. We consider it to be, it's, 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 it's right in every way, and it's always right. And the, and, and the one thing that we're meant to learn and glean really quickly from the word of God is that God can be trusted. Amen. God is good, and he can be trusted. And if your understanding of God is anything other than he is really good and better than our understanding can grab a hold to, if it's anything other than that, you haven't finished your journey with finding him yet. Yeah. Yeah. And if you and, and the other thing we 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 find and this is a really important thing, he never changes. Yeah. So if he never changes and he's really good all the time and, and he's really good to everybody who will who will follow him and join with him and participate with him as he said time and time again, he he will do that for you. Yeah. He's he didn't do that for them so we could read about them. That'd be ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. He did it so that we would know that he would do it for us. Yeah. And so we get into the, the story of <clears throat> we get into the story of how Jesus came to earth, and and uh, we'll probably talk more some more of those details next week. But he, he comes to earth and, and in this miraculous inception and, and God orchestrates all these things to make that happen. Um, and, and it's really easy though in Christendom when you're asked, most Christians why do you love Jesus or what did he come to do? Most Christians are going to say he came and lived amongst us and, and gave himself up to be a you know, sacrifice on the cross for our sins so that we could know him and die and go to heaven. I mean, in a nutshell, that's effectively what everybody believes, right? And that's true. But that's not the whole truth, yeah. is it? That's not the whole truth. He, he wanted to, um, there's a, there was a sacrificial system in place where they could sacrifice lambs and goats and pigeons and doves and oil and grain and all, anything that was of any value, and they could sacrifice it for certain things, and it would 
cover their sin for that year or their praise or whatever it was. And, and, and Jesus kind of fixed that by becoming the perfect sacrifice that would never go bad. It would be forever possible to offer his sacrifice on the atonement of our hearts. Yeah? Atonement in our hearts. He fixed that system, and he and by dying on the cross, we, we effectively could call on, the, on Jesus to be our God, our Savior, and that we could uh, give our lives to him, and that he could cover our sins with his perfect blood, and that we would not have to, in fact, pay the price for what we deserved. We could walk in the freedom that he paid for. John says that he's, he was the light that was in every man who ever came into the earth, this Jesus. But not all chose to be children of his. It's a choice. Yeah. Hebrews says that, that, that the blood of Jesus is not only like sufficient for atoning for sins. It's sufficient to even purge your mind yeah. of the yeah. thought of yeah. sin. Yeah. The memory of sin. He purges your mind of the, the consciousness of, of dead works and sin. It's miraculous. But Hebrews also says where there's no remission of sin, there's no atonement. Yeah. And so we get into this thing where, yeah, he, and, and, and I'm not too, too deep into the atonement, but. Most Christians think that this miraculous inception was just to pre just to precede the sacrifice on the cross so that we could go to heaven. But that's not what it was about. Yeah, he did that. And he had to do that to get us to the ultimate goal. The ultimate goal, if you're wondering what I think his ultimate goal was, I, I like to read the words of Jesus, right? Yeah. The ultimate goal of Jesus could be, uh, I'm not going to say it's one line I can show you, but just read everything in the Gospels. Yeah. And ask yourselves, what is it talking about the most? Yeah. And what is it not talking about the most? What does it barely mention? Yeah, so see, when Jesus was on earth and when Jesus was laying the foundation of what would be the new covenant, closing out the old covenant, creating the new covenant... When he was doing all this, he rarely talked about him, the fact that he was the king. And if you if you just said those words, you'd be good to go. In fact, he didn't really say that. He didn't certainly didn't sulk about spending the whole time on earth saying that, yeah, one day I'm going to be this great sacrifice and none of y'all have to go to hell anymore. Wasn't what it was about. And we read the New Testament writings and we're kind of taught to see it through one lens but if you dig just a little deeper in what some of these words meant, it's so much more. And we've been discussing here for months, we've been discussing in, um, it's really through all the Gospels and all the ways you can see it clearly everywhere, especially once you understand some of the language barriers and some of the words there. But I don't care which Bible you're reading. If you read John, the Gospel of John, chapter 14, 15, and 16, and then 17 is the closing prayer to that conversation. If you read those three chapters, that's Jesus' manifesto. That's his manifesto. That's the last great, clear conversation he's going to have on this earth with the people who he was entrusting to take his mission and go further and spread it all over the earth. Yeah. And none of it was about the sacrificial system being abolished and atoning for our sins. That was just a byproduct of coming to know the God of salvation. Yes? Yeah. And so in this, in this manifesto that I like to call it, is, is uh, John 14 through 16, he, he starts off with this really clear invitation uh, to become this dwelling place. And then he doubles down or triples down or quadruples down on that idea in those three chapels. Multiple, mul he's, he gets very repetitive in this, like, it's this moment where he's, he's, he knows the time has come. He knows his days on this earth is over. He knows that it's, he's getting ready to make this great sacrifice. And mind you, God did not create him solely to die for us. God created him to lead us. Yeah? yeah. yeah? yeah. He was just willing to die for us. Yeah? yeah? And so he, this manifesto starts off in John 14, and it says, uh, you know, if you're reading a... a, a clearer, better translation, it's going to say in my father's house, there are many dwelling places. If you're reading an older translation such like I read New King James, it's the one I've always known, it's hard to switch. It says that in my father's house, there are many mansions. And we've talked about this in here for our guests, I'll do it very quickly, but um, those two things are not as different as you think. 
See, the American English idea of mansion is a big house, hopefully in a nice neighborhood and, and you know, well kept. And it's, it's way, it's just, it's, it's, our, it's the American dream manifested in heaven. Yeah, we get the big house, but it doesn't even make sense. Why would we put big houses in a house? That, that, that's weird. It's like putting little kids' tents in the living room. You know what I mean? Like, why, that, that idea doesn't even work. The direct translation would have been dwelling places, but the jump through the hoop of Latin, we got the word mansion. And if we understood Latin a little more than we do, we don't typically, most Americans don't, we'd know that that word was derived of the word manse. And manse was not the, um, the root word of big house of a nice neighborhood. Manse was what they called the dwelling place for the priest. The dwelling place for the priest, it, it, had, it, had, it could have other connotations, but that was one of the main connotations. It was the home that the priests lived in. Yeah. And, and so then the mansion is the, the plural version. Yeah, so we have this idea that in my father, Jesus says, in my father's house, in my father's kingdom, there are many dwelling places for the priest to live in. Now, did he want the guy with the big hat and long robe and the dingle bears on the bottom? Did he want that guy living in your heart? No. He was sending, as he goes on to explain in this manifesto, he's <laughs> sending, he's leaving so that he can send in his place the paracletus. It's, it's this parallel, this Holy Spirit can come from the throne room where Jesus will later sit once he's resurrected. And he comes and he's, he's saying he will become your priest. He will tell you what you need to know. He will tell you what to say in the hour of trial. He'll be with you. He'll comfort you. He'll strengthen you. He'll, he'll advocate on your part when you need prayer and time and struggle. It's, he's sending. He's like, it's better for you that I go so that he may come. And, and I don't, if you're standing there, if you've walked with Jesus, you gave your whole life to following the man Jesus. How, what an absurd idea, statement is that? What could be better than him with us? Right? What's better than him standing with us in the flesh? And Jesus, in all of his infinite wisdom, said, there's something even better than this. And that's that if you are the dwelling place and I send the priest that can live in your heart. Yeah? yeah. Now, Jesus coming to earth in the miraculous fashion that he did starts to look a little more like a bump in history and a little more like a precedence of how he's going to solve this problem with humanity. See, if the Holy Spirit could overshadow a virgin and implant God himself in her womb in the natural, then why can't we bend our knee to Jesus and, and, and give our lives to him and do the things he says? If you love me, keep my commandments. It's all there. All the instructions to get there are there. But if we believe that he could superimpose and overshadow a woman and create himself in her womb, then why can't we dare to believe that we could truly be the dwelling place for the Holy Spirit? Yeah? Yeah? And we, when we got into this idea, we talked about how, um, you know, there's, if you, if you, there are many people who come to this idea of God and Jesus and they walk and they, and they do their best and, and, and no, no fault of their own. It's just they're doing their best and it's good. And I celebrate everybody in their journey, wherever they're at. And then sometimes they say, there's got to be more than this. There's got to be more than just this idea that God is real. And they begin to search in their hearts and the Holy Spirit will lead them to this place sometimes. If they're willing to bend their neck, bend, turn their necks and bend their knees, you know, he'll lead them to this place. And sometimes they often find themselves in these magic moments, these special places, these church services or whatever it may be. And the Holy Spirit himself is in the room so tangible that they can feel him like he's real. And they think this is that thing that I knew there had to be more. I knew there had to be more. And here it is. And the mistake uh, the easy mistake to make in that moment is thinking that that is the more, yeah. and that's not the more. Yeah. That's the invitation mm -hmm. to more. That's the encourage. That's what Jesus said. That's the deposit, the down payment for what you were really promised. See, we weren't promised that we would be able to go to a special church service and encounter the Holy Spirit in the room. That's just an invitation for him to say, this is what your whole life could be like every single day if you would have it. Jesus. And then we, we begin to dream one day. If you're, as long as you have uh, good leaders in your life who are pushing you to understand that you weren't meant to follow good leaders, you were meant to be the house of God, then one day you'll begin to dare to dream that you were so much more than a person who believed in an idea and then went out and found a room where you could meet him. But instead you'll be, I'm going to be the person who will take him to that room. Yeah. 
I'm going to be the person that whether I'm in that room or not, I know that he's in my heart and I know that he's alive and well. Yeah? And that's the, this idea of this dwelling place is found repeated, repeatedly in this mission statement of God. And I say all that to say, um, I said all that to say, pay more attention to what he did to get Jesus here to begin with. And think about that for your life. You ready? We're going to start over. At the end of the Old Testament. Let's see what time it is. I have no concept. Okay. We can do this. At the end of the Old Testament. We have um, several <coughs> prophetic books. And, and if you don't understand the prophetic books. Don't feel, don't feel bad. A lot of people don't. Some of them are clearer than others. Some of them use very mystical language and it's very filtered through the veil and it's and, and only through the lens of seeing it, what played out in the New Testament does it make any sense to most people. But then there's some others that are very clear. And we get the last book that's in our canonized Bible, Malachi. We have this prophet who uses some of the clearest language of all in, in many ways of, of what's going on with the time with their people. There are people who have... They have, they have been stealing from God. And they're like, how do, you, how do you mean we're stealing from you? And he's like, you don't give the tithes and offerings. And he's like, you, you talk against me. What do you mean we talk against you? There's this dialogue of the, the lost people and then the man of God speaking on behalf of God. And we'll skip all that and go down to the, the end of this story of Malachi. And he says, um, uh, he says, God is saying that if you will give me, I'm going to refer that. He says, in that day, there will be uh, people who keep my commandments, keep my statutes, my, my judgments. There will be righteous and blameless people. And in that day, I will give you, Elijah will come back to you. Elijah the prophet, the man of power, the, the first, like, this is what it looks like to live with the Holy Spirit on earth. Like, the guy who could rain down fire and kill, consume the bulls and heal the people. And, you know, he said, I will sit. He's been gone for a long time by the time Malachi comes. But he says, you give me the righteous and blameless people, I will send back. Elijah, and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers. It's this radical, like, weird, but crazy mic drop moment at the end of our canonized Bible where it's just like, all right, that's weird. Now, we look back at, at this as a history book, then that's weird. Because then it's 400 years later that that takes place. And the mistake to make would be that... God had his prophets, several of them, prophesying this, this intention of his to fix this solution. But then he waits 400 years, and that seems weird. Why would he do that if he's good, right? Why would he wait? And I, I wish I could show you a grander reason as to why he wait, but I can't. Other than God, as someone mentioned earlier, somewhat, really wants us to partner with him. And you see, I, I don't think that God told them 400 years before he would fix all this to just hang in there and the next 24 generations just get the short end of the stick because you're just born at the wrong time in the wrong place. See, that's the plight of humanity that we all want to live in so that we have nothing to do with our solution. But that's not the story of God on earth. The story of God on earth is that he will stop at nothing to find the partners that he needs to fix the condition of the human on earth. And see, then we flash forward to these New Testament stories of Jesus coming to earth. And what does it start with? Read, go back and read Luke. Read it, read it, just read it closely and clearly. It starts off with some really key lines. Malachi, 400 years early, it ends. In that day, give me the righteous and keep my commandments and the righteous, blameless people, I'll give you Elijah. And then we Luke, we get Zacharias, a righteous, as he's described, a righteous and blameless man in the temple. Doesn't sound like God was telling the 400 year future. It sounded like God was looking for something. Yeah? yeah? God was looking for something. And at that time, he found this man who him and his wife Elizabeth were far past the age of childbearing years. But he found this man at this right moment where he also had this highly favored um, virgin named Mary who was not only perfect for the job, but was willing to bear the entire weight of humanity in her lifetime 
to make sure that we had a fighting chance. She also was magically betrothed to a one of the, you know, Joseph had to be just, you know, I mean, that's Jesus's adopted father. God chose him to raise that dude, right? So he, it's this orchestrated, like magical, God gave them parameters, but then he was waiting so he could get all the pieces in place of this righteous and blameless um, uh, Zacharias who was, going to, who was going to hear the word of God, question it. Sure, he questioned it. And Gabriel's like, I'm going to have to just, I'm going to have to zip you up till this is over because I don't need you messing this up. And he zipped him up, but he said the words will fulfill themselves in time if you don't mess this up. So he zipped him up. Elizabeth got pregnant. And then she brought, she brought to us John the Baptizer. That's what his name was. But what did he come as? The spirit of Elijah. Yeah. Gabriel said, I'm going to send in him the spirit of Elijah. And then later, just in case you missed that one, Jesus, they said, Jesus, are, are you Elijah to come? And they said, uh, and then later they say, I thought Elijah had to come first. He said, Elijah did come. If you have it in your heart, he's already come. And it says, and they knew he was speaking of John the baptizer. And so that whole, we, we discussed this for those of you who are there for the Bible study, the whole spirit thing, spirit, soul, body divide. We're not going to get into that today, but the, some of these verses make a little more sense when you start to look at the, the bigger picture. He sent back that spirit that was in Elijah to be in John the baptizer, to usher in a new era of believers, to prepare the hearts and the way of the new era believers that would have to boldly grab a hold to a truth that was so almost outlandish that they were willing to die for. <coughs> and most of them did. So that we could all be here today. Amen? And so God orchestrated, uh, he told them what he needed, but then he had to wait for, them, for, for the, this recipe of humans to, to manifest itself. And he orchestrated all this while, as we discussed before, while orchestrating the, the, the pagan governments of the Roman Empire. He's orchestrating changes to be put in place. A couple of years before Jesus comes, he, he inspires this militant warlord country that's overtaking the entire world, he inspires them to sign the Pax Romana, which is a, a treaty of peace, which allows everyone to go and come and travel freely amongst the different nations, and, and they no longer have to restrict it in travel, which is mission critical in my assessment of spreading this gospel. There's countless other uh, uh, secular government tactics and moves and other Corinth and, and it just irises. There's all these crazy things happening at once. And I don't want to get too lost into the history of the world, but God is orchestrating all the governments of the world, the ones that don't even know his name yet. He's still orchestrating things to make the gospel possible. Yeah. He comes and he over, he sends an angel to, Bert, to the Virgin Mary. And she's like, ah, are you sure? And he's like, yeah. She's like, well, let it be. Whatever you say, let's do that. I'm willing to do it. I'm willing to bear this weight if you can pull this off. And he overshadows her with the Holy Spirit and impregnates her with a spirit from the Lord, a Holy Spirit from the Lord. She doesn't have the, the natural, but he doesn't have the, the natural generational cursings and blessings that would be transferred through the fathers. You ever, that's why we had a virgin birth. He, he beat the system that he created to help the system that he created. See, the system was in place, and there's no beating the system. It is what it is. You can fight against it all you want, but you will not get the results. There's a system in place, and God alone, he has these magic moments where, they, where his people got were so lost and entrenched in their own slavery that there was no getting out, and he would magically send them a savior figure like Moses and Joseph and Jesus and and, and, and they would all save them. They're, those are just types and shadows, archetypes in the back. But they're pointing to this coming Savior who would, in the midst of Pharisaical religious um, oppression and Roman oppression, all these things, that he would magically bend his own rules to get himself in a virgin so that he skips the generational cursing and blessing process and then produces this perfect son that's only begotten of the Father. Yeah? And it's so easy to think about him as the one and only begotten of the Father. But I think it's not that. I think it's just that he was only had the one Father, and we all have two. We have him, the Father, and we have our earthly Father. 
And you see, the reason why it's important to remember that he's not just the one and only is because we have so many verses that say he's the firstborn of many. Amen. And then we have a storyline that says he had brothers and sisters. If, if, if just the straight talk doesn't work, we have the storylines to tell you that he never came to this earth to be alone. He came to this earth to be one of many. And not only did he come to this earth to be one of many, but the father orchestrated the world in alignment to getting him supernaturally put in the womb of Mary to come to this earth. Yeah. And then he went on to do all the things that he did. He grew up and he taught the world these many great lessons. He, he gave us this great manifesto of what the God's true intention on earth would be, that, be, that we would become this dwelling place. And, and if, you can, if you can dare to believe that he impregnated a virgin with himself, then surely you can believe that he can put a dabble of himself in your heart. Yeah? yeah? Amen. But then the question becomes, are we going to follow it? Are we going to listen to it? Are we going to bend our knee to it? Are we going to are we going to listen when it tells us to go left, but we really had planned to go right? Are we are we going to be kind when we want to be angry? Are we going to be merciful when we want to be wrathful? Are we going to listen to him and be transformed? Yeah, because the idea we talked in the early beginning, we said the idea that Jesus came just to be a atoning sacrifice for our sin is it's 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 true, but it's he did do that, but that's not what he came to do. He came to give us salvation. Again, like that whole mansion thing. When I say salvation, most people think not go to hell. That wasn't even, read the Gospels. How often is he talking to you about not going to hell? He's talking almost always about a mystic indwelling of heaven in your heart on earth. Yeah? Yeah. If you don't believe me, go look up the Greek word of what that word is typically, almost 90% of the time, the word in, I in, like in a house, the word where it says in heaven, that word in, take this for what you want, it translates to mystic indwelling. We're not going to a place, we're getting something in us. Yeah? And God went to great, miraculous lengths. To make it happen. And in this season, we get to reflect upon, we get to reflect upon the miraculous, outlandish, in, in a way, way that he got Jesus onto this earth. But I am encouraging you today, as we go into this season, do not lose sight of the fact that that is not a one-time thing that we're supposed to remember forever. That's an event we're supposed to learn from. And that is the links that he will go to get into your heart. And, and while you're thinking about that, think about this. The saddest testimony you're ever going to give is, is I met Jesus one time on the altar of the Second Baptist Church on the first corner in 1982. That's a good testimony. But if that's the only one you got, it's a sad one. Because he wants to be with you in every situation. He wants to be with you for your whole life. He, he, so many of you in here, are just, and, and we've all been there. I was there one time. You, you get, you're excited for Lord, and then something, something gets you bogged down in the mud for some season, hours, days, weeks, months, years. It doesn't matter. And then all of a sudden, you're just like, it's got to be more. There's got to be more. I've got to get back to it, that, that zeal I had for God. And then somehow, you magically, God just orchestrates the universe around you to where if you're willing to walk through the door, if you're willing to knock, he's willing to open and that's every situation of your life. You might be in a really imperfect, bad situation. I promise you, God did not get you there to teach you a lesson. But he is hovering all around you to get you out of it. But getting you out of it will look a lot like him and nothing like you. Because you got you in there, but he will get you out. Yeah? If you, you all have your own stories, whether you know it or not. You all have your own crazy, miraculous stories, whether you know it or not. I won't tell the whole thing, but I'll tell you this. I lived a horrible, rough, violent life in a crime-ridden town when I was growing up. And I, was, I knew all of them. I, I, I was a young man, but I was a wild man. And, and at some point, I had lost, by the age of 18, I had lost more friends than my hands can count 
to death. I don't mean like they just weren't my friends or what. They were dead. We died young in that town. And, and, and I had this moment where I just realized that like this something stirred in my heart. And I just realized that I couldn't go on like this. And I dropped down to my knees at 3 o'clock in the morning in the backyard of some rundown house. And I said, God, I'm starting over. And if you've got something to say, now's the time to say it or else I'm making my own way. I don't even know what I believed or what I thought was going to happen from all that. But that's what I was inspired to say. And you know what I did the next day? I said, I'm getting my life together. I'm going and I'm going to go to CBCC. I'm going to sign up for classes. I'm going to find a new life, new friends. I'm just, I got to get away. I'm not going to survive this. And you know who I met? I didn't fully meet, but you know who I saw that day? I saw Kirsten Parker, now Smith. I was sitting in a, in a room full of lost idiots just like me, and I saw a woman walk by who, in my eyes, was glowing a little bit. And everywhere she went, I watched her walk up to miserable people, and they became happy. And they were happy while she was there, and then she walked to somebody else, and they'd be happy. And I watched this take place for a few minutes in the lobby, and I didn't talk to her, and I was just amazed at what I was seeing. Right? And I said to myself, I'm going to meet that woman, and I'm going to be her friend. Good yeah, <laughs> it took it took us a little bit to, to, to work that out. But guess guess who she was friends with the only guy I knew from where I was from. And guess who she was eating lunch with. It, do you see what I'm saying? I'm not just telling you a love story. I'm telling you a story of how God will shift the universe around you if you're willing to walk through the door. Yeah. And I had choices when I met her. Yeah, I had made resolve to myself that I'm going to meet her, which I did. I had resolved to myself that I was like, I'm going to be her friend, which I was going to become. But then I realized it quickly that like, oh, man, she's, they're really one way. Like, they're like, they're Christians. I've never really met real Christians. And I'm really not. So either I'm going to double down on what I think I am naturally, or I'm going to just zip it like old Zacharias here. And I'm going to follow this crowd until I find something better. So I'm encouraging you, no matter where you're at. No matter where you're at, no whether you hope you've all probably already found him if you're in this room, but there's other situations where he is lining up the doors to walk through, but you've got to walk through them. Amen? And if he can get into a virgin's womb, he can surely get into your heart. Amen? I'm early. So you know over that I get quicker. So, Jesus, we just come before you today, Lord, and we thank you, Lord. Lord, you didn't even have to come to this earth, but you came. You didn't have to fix the broken partnership of humanity with you, but you did. You didn't have to give yourself up for the, to the cross, but you saw that as the fastest way to get us with you. You said in your manifesto, Lord, you said that, they, that not only did you say to be many dwelling places, but you said that you, Jesus, would be in the Father and the Father would be in you and that we could be with you. We could live with you like you live with the Father in heaven. On this earth, in this time, that we can invite you into every situation, in every moment, in every circumstance, that you would, in fact, orchestrate and bend the world around it to create these doors. These doors, maybe they're found on this narrow path that not many people are willing to take. But God, I'm just asking, I'm speaking for a special grace in all of our hearts right now to find the courage to take the narrow path. Find the courage to go find that narrow door that not many people are going to get to. And give us the grace, Lord, to knock until you open. Knock until you open, Lord. You gave us one parable. You said the woman who went to... I don't remember it clearly, but the woman who went knocking on the man's door to get bread for a guest that he didn't open. He said, go away. I'm in the bed. Go away. I'm busy. But she just kept knocking. And he said he didn't, he didn't open because he liked her. He opened because she wouldn't stop knocking. And I'm saying today, don't stop knocking on the door. Don't give up because you came to Jesus one time some years ago and all of a sudden it's hard again. Don't give up. Keep knocking. He didn't come to give us a history book. He came to give us a life lesson. He will get himself in your life if you will have it. So Lord, we just thank you, Lord, for the grace you're giving us to come to you and stay with you. Lord, if we've May taking a misstep or a wrong turn, give us the grace to just get up and keep going. 
No guilt, no shame, no condemnation, no, no looking back and being defined by our failure. Give us the grace to get up and move forward because that's what you paid for us to do. We thank you, Jesus, for this beautiful day. We thank you, Lord, for the food we're going to eat and the fellowship we're going to have. We ask, Lord, that all of our conversations be glorifying of you and edifying for our souls. Bless us, Lord, in this season and bless us, Lord, next week as we come together on Christmas Eve to once again celebrate just what a miracle it was you, you pulled off to bend the rules of the realm of reality to get here, to understand how hard you'll work to bend the, the rules of reality to get in our heart. We thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen.